A piecewise function is a function that's defined to be different things for different parts of its domain. Um, for some part of its domain, it may be part of a parabola. For some part of its domain, it may be partly vertical snake. But if you have a piecewise function, then it's split into sections and different sections have different defining expressions. Now, number 12 was kind of an interesting graph. F of x, what's interchangeable with f of x? Same thing as y. So y equals negative one if x is an integer. If it helps my brain, I can write it down that way. y equals negative one if x is an integer. y equals negative two if x is not an integer. What does y equals negative one look like? A horizontal line. Y equals negative two is a horizontal line. So let's think about that graph. Y equals negative one where X is an integer. Can you, can you just grab that part of it? <coughs> where, where is X an integer? At all the tick marks, at all the tick marks, y equals negative one. Here's negative one. <clears throat> Here's an integer. Here's y equals negative one at that integer. Here's y x equals negative, no, y equals negative one at that integer. Y equals negative one at that integer, and that integer, and that, and that, and that. That's just a series of dots. Not even a horizontal line, because if I filled in between the integers, Y is supposed to be negative two. What's, what's that gonna look like? Pieces of lines that have holes at the integers because y only equals negative 2 when x is not an integer. So I need holes at the integers, and I made my graph so tiny it's going to be hard to show that, but holes at the integers with little lot pieces of line between. And that's going to continue even though I don't have room to continue. What would give me that graph? I mean, what in real life would give me that graph? I don't know. But I do, I can think of um, something that would give you a piecewise function. I don't even know if there are any still cell phone plans like this or if everything on the planet now is unlimited. But back in the day where you had certain number of phone calls and then you got charged for calls minutes over that you had a certain number of minutes of data and then price per gig after that those would be piecewise functions because you would have one charge up until you used all your minutes of data or calls and then after you reach that limit then some other rule is going to apply you're going to pay a different amount after that so it's a piecewise function um, number 13, I'm just going to do it on a different paper to give myself some room here. F of X is defined to be three different things for three different parts of its domain. What is the shape of the piece of the graph defined by the first expression? You can give me words if you're tired of dancing. It's a line. Specifically, it's a line with which kind of slope? 
negative slope, so it should be some piece of line going downhill from left to right. What about the second part? It's going to be, it's a quadratic equation, so its graph is going to be a, a portion of a parabola, a parabola from negative one to one, not in, including the one, but including the negative one. Um, and then what about the y equals two part, negative two part? It's going to be horizontal starting at one and going forever to the right. So it helps me just to make that quick mental image. This part should be, look like this. This part should look like this. And this part should look like that. If I could hold things in my head without forgetting them, I probably wouldn't write that down. <coughs> But I'm past that point in my life. So let's write down what each little piece looks like. That first piece, x is less than negative 1. That's from forever to the left all the way up to negative 1, but not including negative 1. So all I have to do is get these three little pieces in the right place and begin and end them at the right place. This one's going to come down from the left, and it's going to go to negative 1. And it's going to have a negative 1, an open dot in <coughs> the negative 1, because this part doesn't include the negative 1. It is going to be forever to the left, though. What about this piece? Is the negative 1 included in the parabola? Yep, so I'm going to have a closed dot there. And what about the positive one? Is it included? It's not included on the parabola. So this piece of parabola is going to have an open dot right there. And then the horizontal line is going to go forever to the right. It's going to start at 1. Is it going to include the 1? Yes, because it's a greater than or equal. So it's going to look like that. So I have my mental image of what the three pieces of the graph are going to look like, where the open dots and closed dots are going to be. All I need now is to make sure that I get them in the right place. Um, maybe X, Y chart if I need it. Maybe I don't need it. But if I need it, then for the Y equals negative 2X, where all the x is less than 1. Give me your favorite number less than negative 1. Negative 2, that's so boring. <laughs> but it works. What about, to graph a line, I need at least two points. So what about negative 3 and negative 2? Actually, I could go all the way up to negative 1 as long as I... Yeah, I want to go all the way up to negative 1. I just don't want to include negative 1. So if I find those three y values, that'll get that piece of the graph in the right place. And I know that I'm going to go all the way up to negative 1, but not include it. So if x is negative 3, y is going to be 6. If x is negative 2, <clears throat> y is going to be 4. If x is negative 1, which it can't be, but it can be all the way up to negative 1. Y is going to be 2. Just make sure to stop your line at negative 1, 2, and don't include it. Most common mistake is to graph the whole line. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Negative 3, 6. Negative 2, 4. Negative 1, 2, not included. But that goes forever to the left. Does it not ever bother you saying um, that line has negative slope when the arrow is pointing up? Maybe not. Yeah, I don't want to confuse you if you've never been confused before, but if you thought, it's pointing up. Why is it negative slope? Cover up the arrow. Look at the fall of the line left to right going downhill. 
So it has negative slope, and that's correct. And then for the y equals x squared piece, we know it's going to be part of a parabola, and it's for x is between negative 1 and 1, <coughs> including the negative 1, but not including the 1. <coughs> So if you need some ordered pairs, negative 1 squared is 1, 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1. I can put a closed dot on the negative 1, 1 because it's included right there. Negative 1, 1 with a closed dot, 0, 0. I just can't have a closed dot on 1, 1. So there's my little piece of parabola. <clears throat> and then for all the x's greater than 1, y is negative 2. Greater than negative 1 includes the negative 1. No, I'm sorry, this is positive 1. Greater than 1 includes the 1. So when x is 1, y is negative 2, and then forever thereafter. You may not have to show that much work. If you can get the correct graph without showing that much work, that's absolutely fine. I can show less work myself, but my job as a teacher is to show good notes for those people who don't do stuff in their head. Okay. Um, if I had, well, let me ask this question first. Is that a function? Yeah. What about the fact that I could put a vertical line right oh, there? Oh, but that one's not included, so it's okay. It only has a closed dot. It only has one closed dot at negative one. It only has one closed dot at positive one. If I had two closed dots there, it wouldn't be a function. <clears throat> or if I didn't cut the line off when I was supposed to, and I just drew the whole line, it wouldn't be a function. Because there would be um, more than one, make sure I say that right, there would be the same x having more than one y if I continue that line. All right. <laughs> um, the only three problems, no, actually, yeah, three. There were three piecewise functions in your homework. So if you haven't graphed those three yet, do that. Matter of fact, I'll even put it over here on tonight's homework. Page 147, number 49, 51, and 53. If you haven't done those already, then do them tonight. Hey, did Alex come in? Yes. Alex, I'm sorry, I still don't know your name. I have homework for Cody and homework for Alex. All right, do with that, do with that, do with that. 2.6. We have two more sections um, before the test Thursday. And they are quadratic functions and operate, uh, operations on functions. Good news is we already know a lot about quadratic functions. We're going to graph two or three of them very quickly and then do some problems that look maybe different than I would have seen in college algebra. Um, just a reminder, quadratic function, how do you identify them? Highest power is 2, so it's second degree functions. And quadratic functions are usually given to us in one of two different forms. Um, standard form, or I like to call it center radius form, that's what some folks call it, not center radius. Radius here. <laughs> 
um, vertex form. Some books call this vertex form, and I like that because you can look at it and see the vertex based on what you know about horizontal and vertical shifting. If you have y equals x squared, you know it's a parabola. You know that A tells you the concavity. If A is negative, it's concave down. If A is positive, it's concave up. And then based on what you know about shifting, um, that H is your horizontal shift, and it works the opposite of what you might have guessed. The K is your vertical shift on the end. So even without being in section 2.6, I could have graphed that last night by saying the vertex is HK. A gives me the concavity, and I know it's a parabola. So looking at this first example, um, definitely a parabola because of the y equals x squared because of the coefficient negative 2. What do you know about this parabola? It's concave down and because of what you know about horizontal and vertical shifting, what's the vertex? 3, 4. That horizontal shift works the opposite of what you might have guessed, so subtracting 3 actually moves the graph to the right 3, and the vertical shift is 4. So unless I ask for some <coughs> high degree of specificity, you have the vertex in the right place, and you have a concave down parabola, that is good enough. If I wanted to cross the x-axis specifically in the right place, I will ask you for x-intercepts. How do you find x-intercepts? Let y be zero. If I want you to have exactly where it crosses the y-axis, I'll ask you for y-intercepts. How do you find y-intercepts? Let, let x be zero. Um, what's the domain of that function? It goes slowly from forever to the left to forever to the right. There's no real number that would blow that function up, so the domain's negative infinity to infinity. What's the range of that function? Negative. Negative infinity. It's easiest for me to get the range after I graph it and then just say how low does it go, how high does it go. In terms of y values, it goes from negative infinity up to 4, so that would be the range. Um, one other thing you could say about that parabola, because it's concave down, it has its vertex is higher, is the highest point on the graph. You could say that this function has a maximum value at 4. And when I ask for a maximum value or a minimum value, I'm asking you for a y value. What's the highest y value or the lowest y value on the graph? You can tell me that that highest value occurs at x equals 3, but the mm -hmm. highest value itself is y equals 4. What if the equation is not given to me in vertex form? And actually, we mentioned this um, Thursday. There's a tiny baby equation for finding the x-coordinate of the vertex of a quadratic function that's in general form. What's that tiny baby formula? Negative b over 2a. Negative b over 2a. And we could complete the square, but we don't have to. We can use x equals negative b over 2a to find the x-coordinate of the vertex. And once we have that, um, how would we get the y? Like that. Just put that number for x into the equation, and then you, you'd have the y value of the vertex. Actually, if the directions say express in standard form, we are going to have to complete the square. It doesn't say that on number 22, so on number 22, we'll just use our little baby formula here. But if it says express in standard form, then we're going to have to get it um, complete the square to get it in this form. Let's see. We did what this with circles. We know how to complete the square. I'm going to change that f of x to y just for the heck of it. And my note on completing the square, let me write this down again. To complete the square, uh, 
of x squared plus bx. What do we add to the end? How do we find that number? Take half of b and then square it. That's how we complete the square. But that little tip refers specifically to quadratic expressions where a is 1. If a is not 1, I'm either going to have to change this formula or I'm going to have to somehow get the coefficient of, of x squared to be 1. Well, number 10, how could I get the coefficient of x squared to be 1? Just factor a negative four, and I don't really care. Well, hang on one second. I really don't care about this guy. I could add 13 to both sides, but I ultimately want to end up with an equation y equals. So instead of subtracting 13, I'm just going to factor a negative four out of those first two terms. Negative four times x squared minus 4x and just leave the 13 outside parentheses. So far, is that equivalent to the line above it? Yes? Okay. <clears throat> what would I add? Do you have a question? Are you good? Tell me what's going Um, what would I add inside the parentheses to complete the square on the x's? Half of 4 is 2. 2 squared is 4. <clears throat> is that equivalent to the line above it? No, I can't just go around adding 4s wherever I feel like it. If I add 4 to the left, I'd have to add 4 to the right. Or the other thing I could do to maintain equivalency is what? If I add 4 to the right, I could subtract 4 from the right. But there's one other thing. I didn't really just add 4. I added 4 inside the parentheses, but everything inside the parentheses is multiplied by <coughs> negative 4. So what did I really do? You could either say I added negative 16 or you could say I subtracted 16. So what would I have to do to this same side of the equation if I wanted that to be equivalent to what's on the line above it? Right. If I subtracted 16, I'd have to add 16. Now, one thing you could have done, if you prefer, you could have added the 13 to both sides from the very beginning, and then when you subtracted 16 from the left, you could have subtracted 16 from the right. And I said left and right backwards as I was pointing. You realize that. <laughs> That's okay. It's not recording my hand, it's recording the computer. Um, I could have subtracted 16 from the right and subtracted 16 from the left. But ultimately, if I wanted the y by itself, what would I have had to have done after that? Add 16 to both sides. Is that equivalent to the line above it? Yeah, it is. Just stop and check yourself every step of the way. That's equivalent to the line above it. So in standard form, this equation would be y equals negative 4 times x minus 2 squared plus 3. Which is a parabola that opens in which direction? Down. Down. With vertex squared. Positive 2, positive 3. So if all I ask you to do is sketch the graph 
and you have a concave down parabola with vertex 2, 3, that's good enough. Any questions? The reason I had to complete the square here is because the direction said get this in standard form. Well, completing the square is how you get it in standard form. But this next problem, number 22, doesn't say get it in standard form. It just says find the max or minimum value. Where do maximums and minimums occur on a parabola? It's at the vertex, and specifically, it's the y value of the vertex. So um, all these quadratic formula applications that say um, find what maximizes the revenue, find what minimizes the air resistance, find what maximizes or minimizes anything, they're all just find the vertex, find the y coordinate of the vertex specifically. So before I can find the y-coordinate of the vertex, what do I have to find? The x-coordinate of the vertex. And how do I find the x-coordinate of the vertex if I don't want to go through completing the square? That's a little bitty negative b over 2a. <coughs> negative b would be opposite of negative 4, 2a is 2 times 2, so the x-coordinate of the vertex is what? 1. And then the y-coordinate is f of 1, whatever I get when I put 1 into the equation. 2 times 1 minus 4 times 1 minus 11 is negative 13. All right. So what is the maximum or minimum value of that function? Negative 13. And is it a maximum or a minimum? How could you tell that without graphing it? You know that it's going to be concave up, and a concave up function has a minimum that's y equals negative 13. And I think, well, I'm sure on the test I asked, is it a max or a min? That's a minimum value of the function. If I say, where does the max minimum occur, then I'm asking you for an x value. You could say the minimum occurs at 1, but the minimum itself is actually negative 13. Now, what are we finding when we, when we let y equal 0, when do we do that? When we're trying to find what? x-intercepts. Another word for the x-intercepts of a function are the, if that word real, if real was in there before zeros, the real zeros of a function are the x-intercepts. You have to throw that word real in there because you could have imaginary zeros of the function Imaginary numbers can't be x-intercepts. The real zeros are the x-intercepts. Use the quadratic formula to find the zeros of the function. Even if it hadn't told me to use the quadratic formula, when I set y equal to 0, if it won't factor, I know the quadratic formula is the way to find the zeros.
x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. <clears throat> all over 2a. Negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. That's 16 plus 88 is 104. Hey, is it legal to cancel those fours and say that's just square root of 104? Yeah. Uh, illegal, illegal, uh, illegal. You could reduce that sum. I know that at least um, I could factor that 104 into 4 times 26. But really, if you're going to punch it on the calculator, which is what you need to do if you want to graph the x-intercepts precisely, then you need a decimal approximation of the x-intercepts. If you're going for a decimal approximation, you don't even have to simplify it first. You can just pick up your calculator and punch 4 plus square root of 104 over 4 and 4 minus square root of 104 over 4. What's that square root of 104 have to be close to? as a whole number. Darn close to 10. This is about 14 divided by 4, which is about 3.5. If you're not getting about 3.5 on the calculator, you're making a punching mistake. If you're making a punching mistake, the most common mistake is not to have the numerator in parentheses. If you don't have the numerator in parentheses, the calculator is just going to divide the square root of 104 by 4, not the whole thing by 4. So one decimal place, does that come out 3.5, 3.4, what, which one? 3.5, so we were darn close just by guesstimating. And that's about 4 minus 10 or negative 6 over 4, which is about negative 1 and a half. Is that what it rounds to, to the nearest 10? This one we have a little bit more of a precise graph because in addition to the vertex, we know the intercepts. The vertex is 1, negative 13. I don't want to make 13 tick marks. I'm going to make one tick mark and label it negative, 30, negative 13. If you don't label your tick marks, I assume you're counting by ones. If you're counting by anything else, that's fine as long as you tell me what you're counting by. And then over here somewhere, negative one and a half and over here three and a half and that's a pretty precise graph of that parabola All right, a couple problems that are just maybe different. You have to, have to think a little bit harder about what it is you're given and what it is that they're asking for. Um, number 24 and number 36. So number 24, both of them say find the standard equation of a parabola. So I understand what that means. It means getting in vertex form right here. And number 24, I'm given two pieces of information. I know the vertex and I know the x-intercepts. If that's all I know, how can I find the equation of the parabola? Let's say 
and I wasn't given the x-intercepts, how many parabolas could you draw with a vertex two four? Yeah, but they could be concave up, they could be concave down, they could be wide, they could be skinny. So if all you gave me was the vertex, there are infinitely many parabolas that will have that vertex. But there's going to only be one parabola that has that vertex and these two x-intercepts. So that's it. That's it. When they're giving me the vertex, they're giving me the H and the K of standard form. So at least part of the equation has to be Y equals X minus what? X minus two squared plus four. That's a parabola with vertex two, four. So I have satisfied the first condition but if the x is zero, do I get y is zero? Because that's what a y x-intercept would be. If I let x be zero, do I get y is zero? Uh, no, I'd get y is eight. So that wouldn't have the right x-intercept. What could I change about that equation that wouldn't change the vertex, but could give me a different y value when x is zero? What I don't know is that coefficient. So when I'm writing this equation, I'm going to go, there's some un unaccounted for coefficient at this point. How could I find that coefficient? Any, many, many, mo, one of the x-intercepts. Don't plug in the point zero, 4. That's two different points, the point zero, zero, and the point four, zero, any, many, many, mo, plug in one of those two points, that will give you everything you need to find the A. Zeros are nice to work with. Find that X B zero, zero. I'll have zero equals the A that I'm looking for times zero minus two squared plus four. That zero equals four a plus four. What does that mean? A has to be. Subtract four, divide by four, you get a is negative one. So now we have found the only coefficient of the vertex or excuse me, only coefficient of the equation that would not only give us the proper vertex, 2, 4, but it should have the x-intercepts I want now. If I let x be 0, here do I get y is 0? If I let x be 0, negative 2 squared is 4, 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, negative 4 plus 4 is 0. If I let x be 4, do I get y is zero? Yeah. So I've met the conditions I was asked for. I have the right vertex and both of those x-intercepts. All right. We're not going to finish number 36 because I want to get to these two word problems. But how, how would I, my information is just a little bit different. I have the x-intercepts, that's the same as the other one, but the lowest point has y-coordinate negative 6. What's that telling you? That's the y-coordinate of the vertex. Now, if it helps me, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I could graph if it helps me. I know somewhere down here there's a negative 6. But what I don't have here that I did have in 24, and number 24 I had the whole vertex. This one I only have the y-coordinate in the vertex. How do I get the x-coordinate in the vertex? Uh, if the vertex is always halfway between the x-intercepts, so what's the vertex? <clears throat> this is one, two, three, four, five that way, one, two, three, four, five that way. That 
vertex has to be two negative six. And just because I'm going to get to these two um, applications, now that we have the vertex, the whole vertex, I'm going to say finish like number 24. <clears throat> Put in the vertex in vertex form and then solve for the coefficient using one of your two x intercepts. All right. Any questions? The best application of a quadratic equation is the position function, um, which really isn't real life. It's in a vacuum, and unless you're playing inside of a vacuum, you can't neglect air resistance. But it's a very simplified model of real life. Um, an object is projected vertically upward with an initial velocity of some v sub zero that I don't know. Its distance, s sub t, in feet above the ground after t seconds is given by s sub t equals negative 16 t squared plus v sub zero t. How many variables are in that equation? three because I don't know v sub zero. There's t which stands for what? Time measured in seconds. There's s which is distance measured in feet. And there's v sub zero which is velocity measured in feet per second. All right, that's all I know. The A part says if the object hits the ground after 12 seconds, find its initial velocity. There are three variables. If I want to solve for v sub zero, I have to know the other two. So how are they telling me the other two? Okay, so if it hits the ground, then distance. Yeah, yeah, S is feet above the ground. So Instead of calling it distance, I prefer to call that height. And so the height is zero when t equals what? Yep. When t equals 12, h equals zero. Not, no, we don't have an h, we have an s. s equals zero. That should be everything we need to solve for uh, v sub zero. Let's put zero in for s and 12 in for t. Negative 16 times 12 squared plus v sub zero times 12. Somebody punch for me. Negative 2304. That's just this? Yes. Okay. 12 squared is 144 times negative 16 is negative 2304 plus 12b sub 0. Then what? Add the 2304 to both sides. All right. And so the initial velocity is what? Negative 192. Yeah, it's positive. It's positive what? Uh, 192. 192. Gotcha. This, what I just illustrated was looking at the equation, making sure you understand what the variables stand for. And an important question is, how many variables are there? If there are three, then you have to give me two of them for me to find the other one. So I was, before anything else, I was thinking, okay, I have three variables. I have to be given two of them. 
The two that I have to be given, if I'm looking for this, the two I have to be given are S and T. This is definitely giving me a T. I didn't think it was giving me an S until I realized when it hits the ground, S is zero. And then find the maximum distance above the ground. Well, now I have a better equation. Now that I know what V sub zero is, S of T is negative 16 T squared plus 192 T. Now that I know what that initial velocity is. How do I find its maximum distance? Where's the maximum, maximum distance going to occur? Yes. X or the Y? It's going to be the Y. We're going to have to find the Y coordinate of the vertex. Mm -hmm. Y coordinate of the vertex because I know what this whole path looks like. It starts, did it say start? Yeah, it starts at the ground. It goes up, 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 up. It reaches its max height right there at some time and some height. We're looking for that height. So it wouldn't be x equals negative b over 2a. It would be t equals negative b over 2a. What's 192 divided by 32? 6. Six is not the answer because when was not the question. The question was how high is it? S of six would be what you get when you plug six into the position function. Anybody have that punched already? 576. 576, what are the units on that? That's feet, because that's height. Specifically, that is the max height. Any questions? <clears throat> All right, we have one more problem. We may not get it finished, but it takes a lot of words to set it up. And I want you to help me figure out the words that I need. Once I zoom out far enough, I can see the whole problem. I hope you printed it. Let's see. A travel agency offers group tours at a rate of $60 per person for the first 30 participants. For larger groups, up to 90, each person receives a 50 cent discount for every participant in excess of 30. So if there are just 30 people sign up, then everybody pays $60, there's no discount. But if 31 people show up, how much of a discount do you get? 50 cents, and everybody gets that 50 cent discount. If 10 people show up, no, I don't mean 10. If 40 people show up, then how many is that in excess of 30? 10? And so 10 50 cent discounts is how much total discount? $5. All right. So I'm just making sure I understand the problem before I start using variables. Um, determine the size of the group that will produce the maximum amount of money for the agency. Because it is a for profit agency. <laughs> All right. No, no, no talk. Let me, let me talk because we're about running out of time. The first. What do you think we should let X be? What's the question asking for? The size of the group. So let X be number of people. <laughs> it's going to take some words here. I don't read this equation just because just we're running out of time. Let me read it. 
Um, I don't just read that and go, well, obviously, blah, 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 write down the equation. <laughs> if you can, more power to you. But I need baby steps. Let X be the number of people in the group. All right, I understand what that is. If there end up being 50 people going, then X equals 50. Um, I need to figure out how many discounts are received. Do you get a discount for every person? Every person is excess of 30. So how do you find out if there are X people in all, how do you find how many people in excess of 30 that is? 30 minus X, is the number of people in uh yes it would be x minus 30 yeah unless you're taking a negative number of people on a trip that would be the easiest to supervise x equals 30 is number of people in excess of 30. all right which is also the number of 50 cent discount. Everybody's going to get a 50 cent discount for the number of people over 30. Now that's a number of discount. It's not the value of the discount. How do I get the actual number of dollars off for each person in excess of 30? Number X plus 30. That would be the amount of discount. You, the 0.5 times X minus 30 is not the number of discounts, but the amount of discount. If that's the amount of discount, then what is our, each person actually paying? Well, I don't know what X is, so I'm not asking for a number, I'm asking for an expression. But if each person's discount is 0.5 times X minus 30, then what's each person paying? What's each person paying without a discount? Uh, 60, 60, 60, and then subtract that? Yeah. Um, then we're going to default back to everybody paying 60, okay. and so this is going to end up being a piecewise function. Okay. All right, but 60 minus this is the price per person. And what's the thing that I'm trying to maximize? The amount of profit. I don't have a profit equation yet. I just have price per person. How do you calculate profit? Let's say 100 people go. Then, and this is what they each pay. Then how do you get the profit? 100 people times that would give you the profit. So it's however many people go times what each one pays, by definition, that's the problem. Actually, your revenue. That's your revenue because we're not factoring cost in. X times. Yeah, it's, we'll write the piecewise function in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the 0.5. Actually, negative 0.5. That's total revenue. Or X is between 30 and 90. 
um, not including the 30, because if they just get 30 people, then it's going to be 60 times 30, but up to 90 people, and they just can't take more than 90 people. So they'll start a new trip. So really fast, my revenue equation, if I take up to 30 people, then what's my revenue going to be for up to 30 people? $60 per person times X people, where X is less than or equal to 30. That's my revenue if 30 or less, 30 or fewer people go. If between 30 and 90 people go, if I clean this up right here, it's 75 x minus 0.5 x squared. So 75 x minus 0.5 x squared, where x is bigger than 30, but not bigger than 9. I did not read that problem and go, obviously, r equals 75 x times 0.5 x squared. I had to talk myself through it with words. Now I can find the maximum profit if 30 people go, that would just be $1,800. But if more than 30 go, this is a concave down parabola, and what will be the maximum of that parabola? The y coordinate of the vertex. So whichever is bigger, the y coordinate of this bit um, vertex for $1,800, that's how many people you want to take. I can take up to 90. This, the group's not going to run greater than 90. I can't even get that many people on the bus. Hey, y'all be working on that practice test. I hope you already have started. You can do all but maybe two problems on it now. Thank you.